Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jiang Wu. I'm a director of Center for Buddhist Studies here at the University of Arizona. Uh, today, welcome uh, to come to our Obaku Yingen and the Lingyin Lecture Series. Before we uh, introduce our distinct, distinguished guests, we want to uh, introduce this lecture series to you. And the year 2022 marks the 350th death anniversary of Zen Master in Yuan Longqi or in Yingen Duki in Japanese. Special ceremonies and events are held in both Japan and China to honor this great Zen Master. In North America, the Center for Buddhist Studies at the College of the Humanities, uh, University of Arizona has organized a series of commemorative events which began on May 3rd, 2022. These events present and explore the extraordinary life of Zen Master Yin Yuan and the great achievements of the Huangbo or uh, Obaku Chan Zen tradition that Yin Yuan pioneered in China and Japan. These events highlight the intersection between religion, art, and culture in China and Japan. Activities include an online exhibition of works of art related to the Obaku tradition. Please go to ingen.arizona.edu, ingen.arizona.edu. Academic lectures, including this uh, Obaku Ingen lecture series, musical performance, and the tea related events. This lecture series is made possible thanks to the generous support from Wanfu Temple in Fuqing, China, Lingyin Temple in Hangzhou, and Matcha.com. I, I also want to thank our uh, staff at the Center for Buddhist Studies, Miro Kost, and also uh, uh, Ziling and uh, Jeffrey. Now, thank you very much for uh, putting the lectures together. Right? For more information about our lecture series, please visit our website at cbs.arizona.edu. Uh, I want to thank all for uh, uh, audience in the room, but also I want to turn to our online audience. Thank all of you for coming. And uh, we actually have an online host as well, in addition to me. Uh, the online host is Dr. Uh, Robert Gordon. Uh, please allow me to introduce uh, Professor uh, Robert Gordon first. Uh, professor Robert Gordon is right now assistant research professor in the Center for the Philosophy of Freedom. Uh, uh, and also an uh, adjunct instructor in the uh, Fred Fox School of Music, a fellow at the University of Arizona Center for Buddhist Studies and the managing director of the Voice of Culture program. Professor Gordon is right now working with local museums and religious organizations on an exhibition that highlights the importance of the Tibetan stupas located throughout the American Southwest. His uh, book just coming out actually, uh, Buddhist Architecture in America, Building for Enlightenment, he investigates the scriptural foundation for Buddhist architectures and its emergence in an American setting. I, I believe it's the first comprehensive uh, uh, overview of Buddhist architecture in North America. Right? Uh, so right now, Robert, do you want to say a couple of words on behalf of our online audience uh, to uh, welcome our guests and also our uh, audience? Uh, no, welcome. Uh, welcome, uh, Paul. The, the, the nice to see you. And thank you for the introduction, uh, John. And uh, online here, you know, I'm, I'm going to be monitoring the chat. So any questions, please place them, place them in the chat. And I will get them to our uh, speaker uh, once the, uh, uh, the Q&A session starts. Uh, but yeah, thank you for having me here. And it, uh, this is promised to be a, a promises to be a really amazing talk. So I'm really excited about it. So thank you. Great, great. Thank you, Robert. All right. Now, please allow me to introduce our distinguished uh, guest today, speaker, and uh, Dr. Paul Berry. Mm -hmm. Dr. Paul Berry is a specialist of Japanese art history and the cinema. He is living in Kyoto. He has taught at the University of Michigan, University of Washington, and uh, Kansai Gaidai University, Osaka. His publications include Unexplored Avenues of Japanese Painting, the Hakutakuan Collection, uh, this is published from University of Washington Press in 2001. He co-authored with uh, Michio uh, Morioka, Modern Masters of Kyoto, the Transformation of a Japanese Painting Tradition, 
Uh, so this comes from a Seattle Art Museum in 1999. And also the Literati Modern, uh, uh, this comes out from Honolulu Academy of Arts in 2008. He contributed an essay to poetic imagination in Japanese art, selections from the collection of Mary and the Cheney Cowles uh, uh, collection. So this comes from a Portland Art Museum in 2020. Without further ado, please join me welcome uh, Dr. Paul Berry. So, uh, Thank you, I'm <clears throat> happy to be here. I've been to Arizona a number of times, but it's my first time to Tucson and only wish I had more time to explore the area. In any case, getting on with our talk today, uh, it's um, kind of like a, a sampler or a plate of ap uh, appetizers for uh, the topic. And the topic is uh, the Japanese monks of the Obaku sect. As those of you who have read about it or seen the online site are aware that uh, the primary area of scholarly interest, both internationally and inside Japan, has very understandably been focused on the Chinese immigrants who initiated so many different things in 17th and 18th century Japan. On the other hand, uh, their idea of uh, coming to Japan was not to colonize Japan, but to transmit things to Japan. And, and Japanese monks were uh, becoming heavily influenced by uh, Ingen and others, even while they were still in Nagasaki and hadn't set up Manpukuji. In any case, uh, we'll look into some of that. So from the very beginning, there were important Japanese monks uh, and all through the tradition, uh, they were there. And by the later 18th century, the Chinese arrival of Chinese artists were, and merchants were still coming to Japan, but o Obaku priests, uh, uh, gradually uh, uh, diminished in number, but the Japanese number continued and there's hundreds of uh, interesting Japanese monks and we're only going to look at a handful. I'm leaving out many equally important uh, people and we're not going to look in depth at any of them because we have a short talk and I'm just going to give you a sampling of some of the things they were doing, some of the artworks they were uh, producing and a little taste of why they were important. So uh, leaping ahead, so the first person we're going to look at is Shozan Genyo. Uh, the presence of women in, in uh, Obaku tradition has also been largely overlooked as it has been elsewhere. We're going to start out with uh, two uh, Obaku uh, sect nuns. Uh, the most famous, well, they're famous for different reasons, but Shozan Genyo was the eighth daughter of Go Mizu no uh, uh, the, the emperor of the time. And uh, she was living in Rinkyuji, that's uh, part today of Shugakuin imperial uh, residence in, in northeastern Kyoto. That temple is still there. In any case, she became uh, very involved with Obaku and uh, also became extremely devoted to images of Kanon. Uh, uh, Zen, as you may know, is not generally into lots of imagery about Buddhist deities as a whole, but has always had a very special affection for uh, Kanon. Uh, and that's probably, for various reasons, uh, I think of two. One, Kanon is supposed to have given the Heart Sutra. And the Heart Sutra is, of course, uh, key to virtually all Buddhist sects of the Northern tradition, uh, but in Zen particularly, it's repeated many times every day under different circumstances. And also, uh, Kanon is noted for its role as compassion. And uh, compassion is often not singled out as one of the primary <laughs> features of Zen, but it's actually the deeper level of Zen is very involved with compassion as well as the other aspects that we hear about. In any case, we'll look at a handful of her works. Here we have uh, Kanon, an interesting grotto set, setting with clouds. You may have to peer at it closely, but there are actually pine trees at the bottom. Pine trees rising up and then a layer of clouds and then uh, Kanon sit, sitting on a rocky pedestal with a deeper grotto behind it. There's parts of this composition are 
typical, but parts are atypical. Actually, the pine trees are atypical. In any case, she was a very precise uh, uh, painter whose uh, the clothing, uh, the waves, uh, different rock materials and so forth are, are related to Kano traditions and a mixture of Chinese uh, traditions. Uh, I mean, Kano is all related to Chinese traditions, but, but uh, uh, when I say Chinese traditions, I mean recent uh, Chinese traditions. And so we have this uh, mixture and she paints uh, Kano in all kinds of different circumstances. Uh, here's sort of a meditational uh, pose and uh, uh, you can see a similarity in the faces. The faces tend to uh, be very full frontal in, in most circumstances. She does other topics than Kanon, but Kanon is the primary uh, topic. And there's only a handful of these published, but actually there are a great number of her paintings still in circulation and turning up in various locations. And although, uh, uh, Patricia Thister and the other people in the Buddhist Nun Project have been researching her uh, and other Buddhist nuns for several decades. There are even other uh, Japanese scholars who are also taking an interest. And it raises an important connection of what the connections were between Obaku and the imperial lineage. And because there was not only uh, daimyo participation, some so shogunal connections, but also very important imperial connections. And in the midst of all of this, we have this unusual nun. There's another one with a uh, kanon uh, on a lotus leaf. Uh, this was a, a topic, uh, not a leaf, but a petal of the flower. And uh, uh, we get various uh, uh, versions of this. Uh, the most uh, dramatic, and all the paintings we've seen so far are on silk, uh, but this particular painting is on paper, which gives a different quality. It's not the Metropolitan, but it's very interesting because not only is it exquisitely painted and it has a very interesting uh, thing of her not standing on it, but almost sort of a miniaturized version of Kano, uh, sort of um, languidly posed on a petal, uh, and, uh, and so behind it also could sort of parallel with sort of a moon-like image and the an so simultaneously. And then you have inscriptions by both Ingen and Mokoan that uh, uh, give it uh, uh, the Obaku connection, uh, a firm pedigree. This was dated to 1672, which is uh, fairly early in her career actually. And so, uh, most of her works are not dated, so getting a good chronology is hard to follow, but this is important for any number of reasons. The other uh, Obaku nun I want to mention briefly is Ryonin Genso. Uh, this is an example of her Ichigo calligraphy, one-line calligraphy. If you look at the quality of the brushwork, this is what you might call a classical Obaku style in terms of the character of the line and some of the compositions of the characters. But it's done at a very high level. Uh, and uh, she did many one-line calligraphies, but did uh, poems and other kinds of uh, uh, artwork as well. Uh, she became uh, famous slash notorious for how she got into formal acceptance in that uh, uh, she was, had been married uh, several times, uh, uh, but uh, uh, wanted to become a nun and uh, was rejected uh, uh, because she, she was thought to be too beautiful. It disturbed the monastic environment. And she responded by uh, scarring her face. Uh, taking a, a red hot pan and permanently searing her face. Uh, uh, Zen history is full of, uh, you know, dramatic uh, uh, we, uh, statements, many of which are apocryphal, uh, but this one has actually happened, and she would frequently write about it later on. And here's a much later woodblock representation of this scene with a uh, text by the Yute Tanahiko, and um, it's a, sort of a, a popularized version of her. Uh, unfortunately, these dramatic events sometimes overshadow the real substance of their career. But on the other hand, they force themselves into history in a way that they might not have happened otherwise. A person, uh, Tengan Docho, who is still 
rather obscure, although we have some uh, information about uh, he's from the Dokutan lineage and, and we have some uh, uh, information about him. He's a very interesting calligraphy, but today we're not looking at his calligraphy. We're looking at a very unusual painting by him of a Hakutaku. Uh, Hakutaku is one of these amalgam uh, creatures. Uh, well, we'll come back to that. Uh, it's got a, a human face, but with three eyes, and there's three horns and three eyes on the side, and it has a body of a goat and various animal uh, characters that have been combined together. Uh, recently, it's been gaining a lot of uh, attention because some people in the anime and manga world have discovered it. So if you put this in, you'll be showered with caricatures. <laughs> but behind all these caricatures, there's actually a very interesting uh, history and uh, it's still being put together. It has an ancient history in China that's also very spotty. It turns up in various texts and things. Recently, somebody found a small image of what looks like could be a Hakutaku in a Dunmon uh, 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 hanging. So there's a very uh, ancient history, but uh, mostly it was out of the limelight. So getting the uh, um, detailed history is still being put together. But in Japan, uh, Go back to the inscription. Uh, almost all Hakutaku uh, paintings uh, are by little known people and they're part of a uh, nationwide folk uh, cult that was going on. And they, uh, there are stories about uh, Hakutaku being re related to Wang Di, the Yellow Emperor. And, and there's ancient stories about him getting, uh, or it getting uh, power and authority through that. But in practice, it became uh, a deity to uh, help protect you from diseases. And you see these center uh, sections here uh, that have uh, short lines. And uh, so we're talking about each of these lines is, is a phrase uh, meant for protection against a specific disease. Uh, but when you look at many of these paintings, and I've been collecting information on them, which diseases on which uh, uh, painting are different. So it's very flexible in terms of what it was doing. But there, there was something, some of them are almost written like a miniature sutra uh, 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 as a Buddhist uh, uh, chant uh, uh, for protection from disease. But uh, there are other more popular uh, myths and, and popular cultures all full of stories of dubious origin uh, that the Hakutaku was supposed to be very knowledgeable, lived in the swamps and you could catch it, you could ask it questions and get good responses. And there's a whole uh, mixed uh, uh, lineage of stories around the creature. Uh, the early, this is one of the earliest ones. This is uh, dated. A lot of them aren't dated, but this is dated to around um, 17, yeah, 1714. Uh, uh, the earliest dated one is in Okinawa and the, and the Imperial uh, collection there, this from the late 17th century. But the fact that it, this is the only one that I know that has an Obaku connection, uh, but uh, it's very interesting because this sort of mixed popular uh, belief was something that Ingen was doing and relating to uh, uh, culture, uh, uh, popular cultures and popular beliefs and so on. But it wasn't just Ingen and uh, uh, Tengan, but Hakuin a little bit later also became very interested in the Hakutaku. And he, there's three or four famous paintings that he did. Uh, uh, you know, this is about uh, 30, 20, 30 years later than Tangan, uh, but he's dealing with the same uh, figure. When we talk about uh, Obaku in Japan, there's a tendency to focus on the Nagasaki temples, the Sofukuji, Kofukuji, and Mambukuji in Kyoto. And that's natural for their extreme importance. But there are a great many other uh, 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 temples and in Kyoto, historically, one of the most important temples was uh, a rather small temple called Jikishian. Uh, this is a, a woodblock print from 1787 that shows the fullest extent of the temple. And at that time, you can see, although there were a lot, not a lot of buildings, it was a rather complex uh, uh, 
layout. So you have uh, bamboo groves that even when you go to the temple today, the ancestors of these bamboo are all over the temple area here. Uh, but you have uh, uh, groves of pines and plums and various buildings in a major hondo with uh, long covered walkways to other buildings and there's even retreats up on the hillside. So it was a complicated concept uh, uh, layout. And here we have a map, you can see it's above uh, Daikakuji. Uh, it's, it's still quite a, 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 a walk from Daikakuji up there. It's in a very obscure location even today, uh, but it's, uh, uh, that the temple history is interesting in that it was started by uh, Dokusho, who was one of the first uh, Japanese monks to uh, convert to uh, Obaku. We'll talk about him in a minute, but uh, uh, this temple was started by him and then uh, continued to expand until the early 19th century and then kind of died out, but it was revised uh, in the late Edo, early Meiji period by Suzaki uh, Muraoka Kyoku, who was um, uh, an imperial loyalist, uh, a woman who became a, a hugely popular and authoritative. She restarted this temple as a Jodo uh, temple, and it continues as a Jodo Shu Pure Land temple. But they preserved all of the early calligraphies. There's portraits. There's chinzos of the the founder and so forth at this small uh, temple. And if we look at it today. Uh, in autumn, you come through the bamboo groves and then you end up with lots of uh, maple trees. It's a very tiny place, but has become uh, very well known uh, for various, uh, for a sort of a retreat. Uh, the abbots for some time have encouraged women to go there and write anything they wish in notebooks that are left all around. And they have more than 500 notebooks stretching back uh, decades now with uh, you know, reflections and thoughts of women who visited uh, the temple. Uh, Dokusho uh, went, uh, Dokusho uh, studied with uh, Takuan, one of the most famous Rinzai priests of the Momoyama and early Edo. And then he studied with uh, Ishibunshu, who was maybe equally famous at the time. And despite having these uh, really noted Rinzai priests that were sort of the top of the Rinzai sect at that time. He became very interested in Obaku and, and, and traveled with his friend and eventual disciple Getan to Nagasaki in the 1650s uh, to meet Ingen rather early on and soon converted to Obaku and founded the temple we've been talking about. Now his relation, he does a lot of, uh, uh, I'm talking about Dokusho now, he does a lot of inscriptions and calligraphies, but he also does inscriptions and other paintings. Like this is a triptych by Sogani Chokoan. Sogani Chokoan's dates are a little unclear, but it's probably uh, mid 17th century. He may have been born around Momoyama and went into early Edo. And it's likely that these paintings of Rakan were made with out any intention for inscriptions, but later they passed into Obaku hands and the center inscription is by Dokusho and the inscriptions on either side are by Getan, his disciple. This looks a little like Shakamuni, but it's actually a Rakan. Uh, and uh, uh, we can look, uh, here's uh, Dokusho's inscription. Uh, all of these people in the Jikishian uh, tradition were quite uh, excellent uh, calligraphers. Uh, here's his inscription, and here on the flanking side, there's uh, Getan uh, inscriptions. Getan uh, was sort of at uh, uh, Dogusho's side from the beginning, but also very close to Ingen and the other early monks, and spending time uh, uh, at Manpukaji. And not only that, but these both of these people were connected to uh, the high level Kyoto culture. So they turn up in many uh, different areas at the time. Uh, Getan did a tremendous amount of calligraphy. This is uh, part of the title of a hand scroll with a decor decorative underpainting. And here's uh, uh, the conclusion, his si signature and so on. Uh, he's uh, uh, the second generation head of uh, Jika Xi'an. But a, a close friend of these two was Rankoku Genjo. And, and uh, he's sl slightly younger, uh, but was closely associated with both Dokusho and uh, 
Getan, and he did more painting. He's also a good calligraphy, but he did Chinzo uh, portraits of priests, and and here we have a, a painting of Idaten, and uh, that's part of a pair that's linked uh, to a portrait of a priest. Uh, the identity of this priest is still a bit unclear, uh, but we're working on it. You can see he's uh, fairly accomplished uh, as, as a painter, but he also painted in other styles. Here is uh, um, Rankoku working in Kano style. This type of uh, bamboo painting with a section of a huge column and a few leaves was typical 17th century tea related uh, painting can, uh, composition. One of the interesting things that's often gone unremarked is that everybody knows how painters and new styles of painting and calligraphy came in to Japan. But what is less studied is that not only were the Chinese uh, influencing the Japanese, but the Japanese in terms of were influencing the J uh, Chinese. And some of the Chinese started adopting Kano school styles and other things. So the, the influence was sort of mixing back and forth. It wasn't a competition, but sort of a blending. Uh, and of course, this is a Japanese monk doing a Japanese style, but primarily he works in more Chinese styles, but this shows him doing this. And uh, uh, he died before Getan, so he never became part of the lineage. But uh, a little bit later on, uh, Kanen Ginko uh, followed, knew these monks that we're talking about and was also connected to Mount Kukuchi, but uh, also was connected with tea uh, circles. And this uh, looks like sort of a studio title for a room was done for a specific uh, uh, tea master that you see here, Yasutomi Jotsu, uh, who was a noted tea master at the time in, in not in Sencha, but in Mancha. So it, it shows uh, a Chana Yu connection happening at this uh, time period and the continuation of uh, Jiku Xian lineage uh, being important. Here's this uh, seal signature. Jakachu is probably the biggest, uh, one of the hottest names now in Edo period art, both art, histi art historically and in terms of exhibitions and rising values in the marketplace. But, uh, uh, it's interesting that lots of his paintings have uh, inscriptions by Tangai. Uh, and Tangai was uh, uh, also in the Jikishian uh, lineage. And, and Tangai, as you see, died in 1764. Almost all of Jokichu's paintings are not dated. So, you know, getting a sense of when he was doing what is very complicated. But anything with a Tangai inscription has to be before 1764, which means it's, they're fairly early in Jokichu's uh, career, which is obvious, but very rarely noted in Jokichi's studies to this point. The connection with Tangai is noted, but, but uh, using the Tangai inscriptions to locate and focus on the evolution of his style is uh, still um, growing. So this is an inscription by Tangai on that. And uh, here's another uh, Jokichi painting with the Tangai inscription. There are dozens of these. Uh, there may be more than dozens. Uh, uh, they continually uh, come up. It shows that Jokichu was uh, connected to Obako very early on. And, and uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, <clears throat> I would like to see Jokichu repositioned in Edo period art because everybody knows uh, that he did a Chinso at uh, Manpukuji and that he did other things. And his biggest commission was for Shokokuji, uh, Rinzai, with uh, Ime and Daitan, two of his good friends, which, but those monks were also connected to Obaku and, and uh, in constant uh, connection. But uh, Jagachu ended his days living next to uh, um, Sekihoji, uh, uh, a small Obaku temple. He uh, designed the 500 uh, Rakan stone sculptures for Sekihoji. He painted the ceilings there. I, he's always signed himself as Koji. You know, sort of a Buddhist layman, but but I think his whole name, Jakuchu, is a very Buddhist sounding name, but Jakuchu Koji, I think he really considered himself not only Zen, but uh, connected to Zen in general and the Rinzai lineage, but he was most connected to Obaku. And I think there's many reasons to say that. And it's, this isn't like a new discovery, but it has the significance hasn't been fully realized yet. 
and that his works are really, I think, uh, well, uh, un better understood thinking about it in relation to Obaku painting. And one of the many connections he had was with Kakute, uh, Nagasaki Kakute, who came from Nagasaki and, and learned uh, Chinese painting uh, there, but also uh, came to Manpukuji and was in Kyoto at a formative time in Jakachu's career. And there's many reasons, and many I'm not the first to say this, many people have been talking about this for several decades, so there's got to be connections between Jakachu's development and, and his meetings with Kakute and the materials they were jointly uh, studying and so on. In any case, Kakute does a huge array of uh, uh, painting styles, and including complex bird and flower paintings we see example here. And uh, here's another one. Uh, this is a little more uh, unusual with the, the white hawk, but also you see the, the Suisan uh, uh, flower spray down there and the Tai Hu stone, uh, uh, a, a very Chinese uh, feature of uh, the painting. These sort of one-sided compositions are typical of Jakachu paintings, uh, uh, well, uh, that is to say, Nagasaki paintings, Kakute paintings, and also found in uh, Jakachu. Uh, <clears throat> the biggest number of his paintings were ink bamboo, and he did a tremendous number, I'm talking about Kakute here, of ink bamboo paintings of many different styles. Sometimes they're very slim and the leaves are all pointing down, but there's also this thick variety where they point skyward and very dramatic uh, uh, brushwork. And he did cranes, and of course, cranes are a huge topic for uh, Jakachu. And uh, so there's many different reasons to uh, see their uh, uh, connections. Sekihoji is a really tiny uh, temple uh, that's uh, directly south of Fushimi Inari. Uh, so if you go to Kyoto and the, the famous uh, uh, Jinja that has um, uh, miles of uh, tori one after another, it's just... Uh, 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 you know, a, a kilometer south, although there's no direct route. You have to go down and go up. This is a very hilly area. But uh, the, Jakachu's connections to Sekihoji are very well known, uh, but the significance of what they mean in terms of his position as an artist uh, still needs more uh, work. This is the path up to the Sekihoji uh, temple, and you see a little bit of an Obaku-style gate there at the top. <clears throat> Switching to Baisa O, Baisa O has already been dealt with in another lecture, and I'm not going to talk about him very much, but just wanted to point out a few things. Baisa O was connected with, uh, with Taiga, uh, Ikan Taiga, a famous literatus of the mid 18th century. And there's a famous portrait by uh, uh, Taiga of Baisa O that has a Baisa O inscription, but he also did at least three other paintings of crabs on bamboo, of which this is one, uh, where you have the Baisa O inscription at the top the taiga, brief taiga sketch signature. And this one's unusual. If you see in the lower right-hand corner, there's a vertical seal. That's by Kimura Kenkado, one of the most uh, important later figures. A new taiga, but uh, became a central uh, to literati salon in the Osaka area. And he owned this uh, painting and did the box inscription. This shows the Baisa O uh, uh, Poem. This by so poem has actually been identified. It's by his brother Mount Daicho that we're going to talk about in just a minute. So uh, uh, this isn't by so writing his own poetry, but a poem uh, by his uh, lifelong friend Daicho. <clears throat> Baiso wrote a tremendous number of letters that are still being uh, discovered and are constantly evolving our understanding of his life. Uh, there's also many uh, portrait sculptures in ceramics uh, of Baiso. Most of these seem to be uh, late uh, 18th, early 19th century. This is one in Boston. Uh, this is one that emerged in Japan recently. They're about uh, almost a meter in height and hollow. And actually the head and hands come off uh, and, and, and they're fired separately and then inserted together. This shows uh, still unidentified name of the artist there in the seal. Um, this is that same sculpture with the head removed. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the back, they have him seated on this uh, wooden, uh, uh, not wooden, a wicker um, 
uh, sea, which is you find in paintings as well. So it's a very detailed thing. Where were these sculptures used? There had to be sort of alcoves set up to honor uh, uh, Baisao in various temples and private locations. There's still one at Mampukaji, but there had to be many more to generate these large scale ceramic sculptures, which are very atypical. Uh, there's lots of sculptures going on, but ceramic sculptures of this scale are quite rare, but there seems to be uh, many of them for uh, by so um, If you're interested in him, I recommend these two books. There are various books in English and Japanese, but these two are, are both by Norman Waddell. The one on the right uh, contains, translates almost all of his known po poetry, but gives a biographical summary that is in part based on several decades of research on his letters. So there's all kinds of information in these books that are not found anywhere else, because he's the only one that's located the letters and translated them and uh, tied together some of this. So the first one came out in 10, uh, 2010 on the right, uh, but the second one is not, is a totally different book. <laughs> One is not a translation of the other. This is a different book. And he continued to work on the letters and he simplified the English thinking that they won't, Western readers won't be interested in all the details. So the really deep study of those letters is in the later Japanese version that you see on the left. So it's important that if you're studying him that you're availing yourself of both works because they're quite different from one another. And uh, both have their virtues for various reasons. Uh, Daicho that I just mentioned also came from Fukuoka in the same uh, home temple area as Baisao, and they sort of grew up together. And uh, uh, they even their careers zigzagged back and forth. They were in constant communion. Uh, Daicho became one of the most famous for the excellence of his Chinese. And uh, there's a recent thousand page book. Uh, that's come out in Japanese. It's rather hard to get a hold of, but it's a thousand pages of his Chinese texts in small print. <laughs> and uh, he, his calligraphy tends to be this reserved kaisho, like you see here. And here's a text that may not even be in those thousand. It's uh, it's uh, the <clears throat> the record of the twin uh, or the uh, twin crane um, pavilion. And then so you have this text with the date and so forth. Uh, the, the, he's a, a critical importance of not only for his Chinese, uh, he was supposed to know Chinese tones and be able to converse directly, which is still a rarity at that time uh, with the Chinese monks and was uh, a considerable intellect and was also helping to pass on uh, the tea tradition of Bai Sao. And just one more word about Bai Sao is that um, he resigned from being an Obaku monk uh, to become Koyu Gai by Sao. And he did this not exactly as a protest, but he was feeling constricted living by the monastic rules and monastic routine and wanted to approach the transmission of the sea uh, as in another way. But <clears throat> to do this, he had to involve an enterprise. He had to be on the street selling stuff. As a Zen monk, that's against the rules. It's strictly forbidden to do this. And, and he had to leave this act to do it. And he did that. And then he was criticized for it. And, and Norman Waddell's earlier English book, you get the translation because of Baisao's response to critiques of why you, how can you be a Buddhist monk and sell, sell stuff, you know? And he gives a long, uh, very intelligent and interesting and sophisticated response to what he's doing and why, and why this is all okay. Uh, and so this is a uh, very interesting, it's a, a significant thing about the complexities of living as a monk, uh, whether it's Obaku or whatever. Uh, there's the title of that uh, text. He also did lots of other inscriptions. There's a, I, I don't have the photograph here. This is the box, but there's a, there's an iron Nyoi scepter that was supposed to have been owned by Ingen that was it was inlaid with another metal and it's decorated and rather complicated. This is the inlaid box for it, but Daicho wrote a hand scroll of his history that goes with this. And, and uh, so this is another example of his text, but also his devotion to Ingen and the Ingen tradition and so forth. Uh, Other monks that were connected to Baisao and to Daicho includes the Isei-born Goshin Gimyo, who also became connected 
to literati painters and poets all throughout the Kansai and, and uh, uh, a very interesting uh, figure who is also key figure in the transmission of early Baisa O style uh, tea ceremony. This is a very interesting painting because it's, uh, it's uh, an old block of Zen monk once again going into popular culture of the, of the Otsue paintings that came out of the city of Otsu, where there are all these folk paintings that came up in different themes that started in the late 17th century, became wildly popular in the 18th century. So wildly popular that they were being sold both as protective things for the home, uh, where they're little like Chinese door gods, if you will, but something that you paste on the walls and, and so forth, but it was also being used as uh, tourist things if you went through Otsu. But this is loved by uh, painters of all kinds when they started developing it. But the Oni Nembuts, it shows a demon in the form of a, of a Buddhist priest chanting on the street, the Nembutsu, you know, the key pure land phrase. And he's got the gong and the bong and, and the hammer, but he's a demon. Uh, so there's a satire involved, but it's uh, one of the great things about uh, Buddhism in Japan is that you find lots of priests doing paintings that are semi-satirical of who they are and what they're doing. And rather than rejecting it or getting upset, they jumped on this and, and it was an uh, effective uh, interconnection with the uh, populace. He's an excellent calligrapher uh, and his inscriptions on many paintings and separate uh, things had huge uh, relations. There shows a typical Otsue of the 18th century. So this, on the right, we see this mass-produced anonymous Otsue of Oni Nembutsu, and then you see uh, his version of on the left. He's playing around with it. Uh, Oni Nembutsu, the real ones, always have two horns, but he made a single horn uh, like this uh, coming out of his head. So there's a lot of uh, playful things going on, as well as it having uh, a Buddhist didactic method, uh, message that's always found in these kinds of paintings. One other person that was also friends with all of these, Daicho, Baiso, uh, Gemyo, was Monchi Jofuku, who was uh, uh, hugely popular, and he was popular not only in the Osaka area, but he had friends in, in Edo, you find his inscriptions on Hoitsu paintings, on paintings from people in Nagoya and Osaka. And he had one of the most independent, unique styles of calligraphy in the history of Japanese uh, obaku zen. It's entirely unrelated to typical Japanese uh, obaku calligraphy, but very elegant uh, uh, and rather angular and quirky features, but ones that really work well. And uh, this, this is a Chinese poem. Uh, looking at, here's two details, and you can see this sophisticated sense of balance that he's, uh, and the angularity of, of the strokes and the composition, and uh, really an exciting, uh, very creative uh, 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 person in calligraphy. Most of his calligraphy is rather small, but sometimes you get bigger uh, characters. Here's a look larger character uh, inscription by him. Uh, unmistakable style that you can recognize a long ways away. And he painted on Mariyama Shijo. Here's the Yamaguchi uh, Soken. Uh, 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 here's a Monchu inscription on bird and flower uh, paintings. Actually studying the inscriptions on, on um, paintings of beautiful women or birds and flowers and so forth. Uh, these inscriptions usually take typical themes and give them a Buddhist twist in one way or another. I haven't worked this one out, but it's very, it's a worthy topic of discussion. Of what about Buddhist inscriptions on non-Buddhist topics? Uh, because there was a lot of that going on. Uh, skipping ahead uh, much later, uh, we find, uh, Tanamura Chokanu had one of the most convoluted and interesting uh, interactions with Obaku. Uh, Tanamura Chokanu was the adopted son of uh, Tanamura Chikuden, a very famous painter from Oita. Uh, he comes from the town of Takeda. Uh, it's a mountain range. And when uh, Chikuden was still childless, uh, uh, he came across in the same town this young boy who even at six or seven years old was already very talented in painting. And he, as a result, he adopted him and raised him as his son. Later he had uh, 
sort of a biological son of his own, but he and Chopinu uh, were uh, in constant connection until his death. Chikidin, I'm not showing you his work, but Chikidin was already interested in Kanon paintings of the Obaku style. And we mentioned earlier with Gemmyo that uh, uh, Kanon has a special, you know, position in Buddhist iconic paintings in Zen. And in the literati tradition, they could draw on different different styles of doing Kanon, but the most appealing was the Obaku style, uh, Chinken uh, and uh, 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 other uh, uh, early obaku uh, painters, their ways of depicting Kanon became not only popular with Chikadin, but hugely influenced Chokinu and actually huge numbers of painters all through the 19th and well into the 20th century. They do them in all kinds of ways. Here's especially a dramatic one where you have uh, uh, Kanon uh, in a, sort of a literati sencha format with a uh, with a sort of a, a rug and a various uh, honorific utensils and so forth, uh, but under this towering sort of exaggerated uh, taihu type rock that has been greatly changed into sort of a geometric pattern on the left, uh, very um, innovative in terms of taking a tradition and playing with it in different ways. Here's another unusual kanon. Uh, a painting uh, that has a very complicated uh, inscription, but is a title with a koshoku, or this this it brings in a, a sort of a emotional uh, uh, connection to uh, Kanon that's uh, a very intriguing and again a fantastic uh, Taihu uh, stone uh, next to the figure. He did primarily landscapes through a very long career. Uh, he lived uh, well into his 90s, and even in his last year was painting very complicated uh, landscapes in a very precise way. But he did a tremendous number of uh, Buddhist paintings, not just Kanon, but, but especially Rakan. And he did large numbers of Rakan paintings. And this is one from a mid mid-career. Uh, if you notice the red-robed uh, figure at the top, um, uh, that figure is the same Rakan that we saw earlier on in the Nichokuan series. It has a little bit of, looks a little bit, sometimes a little bit like Daruma, a little bit like Shakyamuni, but actually it's a Rakan that has some overlapping uh, iconography. But his involvement with Rakan paintings would became an economic en uh, engine for what he was doing. Because mid-career, he became hugely involved with Sencha. He uh, became organized in the 1860s, one of the biggest Sencha events of the 19th century in Osaka. There's a big stone memorial even today in central o Osaka that was from that time. The uh, same one, Chakai, there's woodblock prints that were or books that were published at the time and a huge amount of things. That cost a lot of money, but he became an Obaku monk, actually, and, and became part of the lineage. Uh, and uh, 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 his connections with Obaku kept growing until he, uh, uh, Dokutan's uh, sub-temple, Shishirinin, Shishi had fallen into disappear, disrepair and virtually disappeared as a physical place he decided to restore the whole thing, build the buildings and, and re revive the whole sub-temple. And he did that, but it required a lot of money. And one of the ways that he raised money was selling Rakan paintings. And so this is a very simple uh, Rakan painting. Each of these Rakan paintings have different poems that he composed. He actually published a book with, uh, I don't know, uh, a thousand or more Rakan poems in it. Uh, and so they're, uh, sort of mass produced, but they're, none of them are the same. They're all different topics. And here we have an unusual topic of a rock on looking into a mirror. <laughs> and of course, one thing Zen uh, priests are not supposed to do is look into mirrors. In fact, Zen temples are supposed to get rid of all your mirrors because you're not supposed to think about your appearance. And so uh, there's uh, comic elements and various uh, meanings, but but I want, using this painting, so we want to look at the seals, because this has five seals on it, but we want to look at the seals under his signature. Because here we have uh, 
uh, Dinchi, one of his name, Dinchi Noin, and then uh, Chokunu um, uh, Bo Nasambo, uh, that's his studio name. But the seal of importance is the bottom one with uh, uh, the Daya uh, Rakanzo, Go Sen Puku no Ichi. <laughs> this is one out of 5,000 paintings and this format of, of Rakan's all different with different poems. And he literally made 5,000 paintings and he did them very simply so he could produce such a tremendous number and they were all for sale. Uh, and by getting 5,000, he could raise a massive amount of money because he was a hugely popular painter and he used this money to uh, build, rebuild the temple. Uh, uh, he wasn't the only painter doing this, even in the 20th century painters wanting to use a lot of money would sometimes say, well, I'm going to make a set of 50 paintings and sell them all separately, raise a lot of money to achieve this goal or that goal. So it's a tradition, but I don't know of anyone else who made 5,000 <laughs> uh, uh, paintings. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, his producti productivity was amazing. Um, so let's take a look at Shishirinin as it exists today. Actually, Shishirinin, though it's still there, has fallen into, it's still active in some level. They have rituals that they do throughout the year, including honoring Chokunu and so forth, uh, but, uh, and, and even Chikudin, uh, his uh, father. Uh, but until recently, it had been dropped off the maps of <laughs> Mount Pukaji. You could see a map and there's no Shishirinin. And actually, decades ago, I thought, what happened? He did all of this. Where is it? It's not on the map. So I went digging around in the eastern hills and discovered it. <laughs> and there it was. But now it's gradually achieving some, it's being cleaned up and so forth. But this is its entryway there. And it's on maps now. And this is the entryway to the main hall that Chopinu built. Uh, and next to it is the Gazendo. This was Chokunu's painting studio uh, that was next to it. And uh, uh, he did many paintings here. But this story is not just a happy story. It's a very complicated story because his doing this, I mean, he's a, a secular painter who becomes, uh, who's infatuated with Obaku styles and Zen and becomes part of the lineage. Uh, but then uh, there's controversies within the Mampukuji tradition of his position in there and he was there for close to 10 years. Uh, but then another uh, 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 priest who was actually in the Dokutan religion because a uh, uh, lineage, because this, this sub temple was founded by uh, Dokutan and, and he challenged Chokunu's right to be the head of this, even though he rebuilt all, everything and did all this, he said, you're not, of the Dokutan lineage, you should not be uh, the Jushoku of this uh, temple, and basically drove Chokunyu out. And he moved to another place uh, in Kyoto and continued. He didn't break with Mampukaji or uh, things, he was still connected, but it was a political turmoil inside the sect, and, uh, and it passed into other hands. But his studio and the buildings are still there, and they still have yearly uh, ceremonies honoring Chokunu and even his father, uh, uh, Chikudin. This is the Chokunu's own plaque to his Gazen Do studio that's above the uh, uh, entryway. And you can see it's dated to uh, uh, 1899, uh, Meiji 32. And this is a screen that he painted at that studio. Uh, uh, this is a uh, typical, he, he will paint paintings with heavy color and so forth, but this is, uh, he did a lot in ink. And this is a very uh, large uh, uh, 12 panel screen. Uh, and you can see it, it uh, forms a single composition with a bay in the center and mountains on either side and has a lot of interesting features to it. Uh, just to uh, uh, give you a little bit of a, a taste of it. Uh, in terms of the complexities, we'll see him do very simple sketches like the, the rock on we looked at. So this is moderately compl complicated, still all in ink, but he also does intensely colored things that are minutely detailed. He works in all kinds of different styles and was heavily studying Chinese paintings, uh, collecting them and uh, 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 studying them. This is inscription, the inscription on one side. Uh, this is uh, 
uh, stating from the Meiji uh, 39, or rather, excuse me, uh, 34. Uh, so this is 1901. Uh, and it mentions Mampukaji here in the middle uh, uh, and another place there. But the other screen, specifically mentions uh, the location of its creation. Um, let's see, it's uh, in right here. So we have Obaku Shishi Vin In Gazendo. That's that building that we were just looking at. And uh, so it's, it's interesting to see this is one of the works that he actually did there. And, it, and it's a very large building with many tatami mat room inside that could handle the creation of like large works like this as well as the regular scroll paintings. This is a portrait of Chokinu uh, just a few years before his death by his son. Uh, and and uh, so it, it has his son at the foot of his father. Uh, uh, the other famous uh, older literati painter of this time was Tony Okatesai. Uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, Chokinu was a bit younger uh, than, or, or rather a bit older. Tessai was the, about uh, uh, 10 years uh, younger than uh, Chokinu, but the two of them by the late Meiji period were the, the two sort of literati immortals because they went around in old fashioned Chinese style clothing, had long beards and staffs and were, you know, uh, famous features of the Kyoto scene. Chokinu and Tessai had a complicated relationship. They went together for many different uh, uh, projects. Uh, uh, Chokinu just wasn't a traditionalist. Chokinu de designed the first modern school of Japanese painting in Japan before Tokyo. Uh, and he made a complex proposal to the city government with a diagram of how the school should be uh, designed. It wasn't accepted, but a whole uh, many other artists uh, of other schools took the same design, <laughs> these documents still survive. So, you know, it's the same design and resubmitted it under their names and it was, success it was successful in the second time. And then uh, in appreciation for him being the impetus, they made him the, the honorary head of the school for a few years, uh, Chokinu. So <clears throat> this, this uh, school, not only uh, taught Chinese style painting, but different schools and was also uh, a few years ahead of the Tokyo Gaidai tradition and so forth. Although you won't find this story being told too much in Tokyo. Uh, even today, there's a lot of regional uh, histories that are involved, but this is actually earlier. And, and it also shows how complex the history and the development of painting was at that time and how uh, Chokinu and Chokinu as an Obaku monk was involved in all of this. And so by extension, Obaku was also connected to these things. And so this is a, an unwritten uh, chapter in Obaku history. Uh, <clears throat> here we see him, he's holding, uh, Chokinu is holding uh, um, a book of seals in his hand. And these, all of the, all the seals you see above him are Chokinu's own seals. His son took his seals and covered the surface of the painting with them. Chokinu had hundreds of seals, even more than is on this painting. And, uh, <clears throat> but the seal that he's holding open is a seal that was owned by his father that he was in possession of. Uh, and his father was an even more famous artist. So that him holding, uh, here you have the son you know, holding, you know, uh, a hand scroll looking at his father, joking he's holding a, uh, a book with the seal of his father. And so you, you get, when you go through all these things, you find uh, lots of interesting uh, linkages. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the study of the seals and Chokinu had huge number of seals. He carved some, but he had Chinese seals. He had seals by a great many people. Both he and Tessai were two of the most prominent seal collectors in Japan in the Meiji period. And they both had hundreds of uh, uh, seals uh, and uh, that are interesting for a whole many, uh, a great variety of reasons. And also, <clears throat> 
seal carving changed greatly with the uh, arrival of Obaku sect in Japan because they were bringing all kinds of new seal uh, uh, styles and many of the monks were accomplished seal carvers. They taught that to Japanese who themselves became uh, famous for all kinds of different styles of uh, seal carving. Uh, that's a very complicated but very interesting uh, intellectual, artistic and aesthetic uh, history in, in seal carving, but we don't have time for that today. But the fact that it was very important to the people at the time, you can see <laughs> with all of these seals here. This is a portrait of his father, but part of being a portrait of his father is seeing all the seals as sort of a metaphorical portrait of his father. Because these aren't just names, they're poetic inscriptions. They have references to all kinds of different poets and philosophical meanings and aesthetic things. So when you read them, the, the, the layers and implications just keep rippling outwards. And so it's very interesting to have a portrait where two thirds of the surface is devoted to seals. It's not trying to say he's a great seal collector. They're wanting people look at it to read the seals, <laughs> just stand there and read them, which back then most literati could do that very easily. Uh, today, it's a little more difficult. And then uh, uh, this is uh, Mom Pugaji in November last year uh, as uh, uh, John Mu is just uh, uh, saying this is a commemorative uh, time for the 31st anniversary of, uh, of uh, Ingen. And uh, going there at that time was really stunning to it because I've been to, to I've been going to Mampukaji since the mid 1970s when I was studying Ika Taiga and Taiga was connected to Mampukaji from childhood uh, until later in life. And there's many uh, he, uh, some of his the, the, probably the largest uh, ink uh, finger painting in East Asia was created by Taiga for Manpukaji. It's eight full Fusuma panels in one composition. So it's enormous. And, and uh, uh, finger painting came from China, but spread throughout East Asia. Uh, it's much more popular in China than in Japan, but it's practiced some in Korea. But Taiga was particularly interested in. Oddly enough, Taiga was mostly doing finger painting early in his career in his 20s, but then with a commission from Obaku uh, Mampukaji in his 40s, where as far as we know, he may not have done finger painting very much for several decades. He does a tour de force uh, colossal uh, 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 finger painting of, of great excitement. In any case, to study Taiga is to study Obaku, and if you're going to any depth and, and not just Taiga, but so many uh, different artists. And, and now in the post-war world, um, as you may know, the connections between the home temple in Fujian and, and uh, Japan has been reestablished. There have been exchanges going on for a long time. And, and this year uh, they had uh, Chinese coming with contemporary Chinese decorations. We had more images, they covered the the, the central compound of, uh, of uh, Mampukaji with all of these uh, bamboo and paper framework, brightly colored Chinese decorations that uh, probably never existed there before, but it's a good symbol of bringing old and new China and Japan uh, back together at the time of this uh, uh, occasion. And uh, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, going through these, um, different images with you has been uh, just trying to ignite uh, uh, further interest in the study of the Japanese uh, side, uh, because uh, we've been through a number of figures, but actually there are many people more, some is equally important, even more important than what we've dealt with before, and many others waiting to be uh, uh, rediscovered. The, <clears throat> the works of the artists that I've shown you are in three places, maybe. They're in original Obaku temples, and a lot of the uh, Obaku temples uh, are no longer Obaku today. Uh, like Jika Xi'an is a Jodoshu uh, temple. There are numbers of temples in Kyoto that were founded or sometimes changed sect to become Obaku, and then uh, later moved into other Buddhist sects or into regular Rinzai. 
but with uh, Japanese practice of honoring tradition and taking care of your art objects, those temples still are crammed with obaku, calligraphies, paintings, chinjo, and stuff, even though nobody thinks of them today as an obaku temple, but for 100, 150 years, they were. And those objects are often still poorly recorded today. I was talking to the head of the, the Bunkaden uh, Museum at Mampukaji, and we were discussing the different uh, temples, and some of them they've had access to try to catalog the others they don't have access yet but they're aware of these things and it's not just uh, the topic of seals came up and he said <clears throat> Mampukaji has a large re reservoir of the early obaku uh, seals from the major monks uh, but he says actually it's not just Mampukaji many of these other uh, uh, temples that these monks were associated also have seals uh, the original seals uh, and original seals are not only interested for their materials and their construction, but sometimes they have inscriptions on the side of who cut them and when it was done, and even, sometimes even poetry on the side. So studying the seals of, as art objects is very interesting. Um, Osaka, uh, um, one of the striking things about the Obaku seals for the early uh, people was that mostly if stone seals are being made, they're made out of what's commonly known as soapstone. It's a, it's a kind of a, steatite. Uh, any case, it's a very easily carved stone. Uh, and, and yet some of the obaku seals are not out of that stone. They're out of rock crystal, which is incredibly difficult. In fact, it can't be carved in a normal way. It has to be drilled. Uh, and it takes a totally different uh, 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 manner of doing it and occasionally these have been exhibited and it changes the shape of the line and the design because you can't use the, uh, the metal tools that are normally used in seal carving but you have to use uh, drills and it becomes like working with jade uh, you have to do everything with drills so in any case this may seem very technical but if you actually see the objects they're incredibly beautiful in, in themselves and were meaningful uh, to people on various levels in any case uh uh, there's much more to say, but I'm interested to hear questions. Uh, so if people, actually, one of the things about Chokinu, Chokinu's career as an Obaku monk is so complicated. Some people have studied Chokinu for a long time and never realized that he was ever an uh, Obaku monk. Although once he became a priest, he started using his priestly name sometimes and, or writing that he was uh, uh, painting at uh, Mampukuji or at uh, Gashindo, that studio. Uh, but there's a, uh, <clears throat> there's a possibility, and I'm still working this out, that he was uh, uh, given uh, ordination twice, uh, which is very unusual. Uh, but some records I've seen seems like that at a certain earlier stage, he was taken in and given sort of uh, uh, a Buddhist name and put into the lineage, uh, but someone later challenged that. And it was redone uh, later so that some inscriptions show him at different, in a different point in the lineage. Uh, whole kinds of questions of lineage is uh, uh, very complicated in Buddhism, uh, very complicated in Japan. The, the, uh, the theoretical idea of uh, lineage was that, uh, how do you know if someone's enlightened? How do you know if they've really attained uh, uh, understanding? Especially if you're an adherent, but you know you're not enlightened. So when you're looking at all these people wearing robes and heading temples, who's good and who isn't, and who's real and who isn't? And so the idea of lineage became very important. And then having documents that would prove, like, you think I'm bogus, but look, this is my teacher. You know, you have Inca that with certificates of enlightenment and also other certificates for succession and so forth. But this has always been very controversial because, well, one, you can forge them, or sometimes you have priests that give out hundreds of them, and sometimes you give out priests that apparently never give it, although they've been teaching students for decades, and uh, very complicated. Uh, 
Oh, and, and just speaking more broadly in terms of the Rinzai tradition, one of my favorites dealing with the whole problem of Inca is the famous uh, Iku Sojun, uh, 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 because uh, he got his Inca after uh, uh, long trials and uh, he immediately tore it up because he was fed up with the idea of like, you know, if you can't prove that you're authentic without showing a piece of paper, then this is ridiculous from a Zen point of view. And so he despised them. However, according to the tradition, his disciples, of course, were appalled. Their teacher just stole up, <laughs> tore up his, his Inca. We can't have this. So they were supposed to have gathered up the pieces and passed it together. And sometime later presented it to him as a gift, <laughs> which further enraged him and he burned it. <laughs> the, the, <clears throat> yeah, the, Actually, there are later find there are lots of the excellent the Japanese painters and all about the monks. Uh, so they they emerge as very mm -hmm. important, continuing mm -hmm. the tradition. It's really great. I think we can open up to the questions mm -hmm. in the room. And also uh, for all online audience. Uh, so Robert, uh, are you there? As I saw there's some online questions already. Is that uh, that's correct. Yes, first uh, um, we do have uh, an online question. Uh, um, one of our online listeners would like to thank you for an exhilarating talk and ask how many uh, Chokonyu, uh, Chokonyu's 5,000 Rakan paintings are known to survive today? Oh, excuse me, I started reading the thing online. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> oh, certainly, yeah. So how many of Chokonyu's 5,000 Rakan paintings are known to survive today? There's no way of knowing. They uh, uh, undoubtedly many have disappeared, but actually they often turn up in one place or another. Uh, so they're uh, they float up in the marketplace various ways. Lots of people, very few people, are reading seals anymore. And this is 500, but there's other. He did many more rockins. There's he did a set of 100, and there's a seal of one out of 100. He did another set that's one out of 500. <laughs> And I was thinking 500 was really impressive until I started finding these one out of 5,000. And uh, so uh, one Japanese scholar that I met uh, thought that he was actually using a special kind of brush uh, using this, but that hasn't been uh, confirmed. But they're, they're out there. And again, there's a, he made a woodblock print, uh, printed book of the poetry involved. So just no images, just the lines of poetry that he put on these paintings. So that's a, a separate publication. Actually, he did numbers of woodblock prints that are very interesting, including one that uh, uh, Chuko uh, Sansan, that is a record of about uh, uh, 80 or so Chinese paintings he saw him did minute copying of them uh, in somewhat of his own style on one side. On the other side, he gives his opinion of the painter. The Chinese painter and so forth, studying Japanese literati artists' opinion and what their access and what they thought of of both ancient Chinese painters and rather uh, near contemporary uh, Qing painters is a very interesting uh, publication that has been little studied. He had a big collection of Chinese paintings and uh, some of them were given to the uh, 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 the. Kyoto Geijutsu Daigaku, the art, art college, and a few years ago, they had an exhibition on some of them. Nobody had seen these in maybe 80 years, but astonishingly, many of them were of high quality because forgeries were rampant in Japan, but the ones that they exhibited, uh, they're not the most famous painters, but they were very high quality, uh, 34 paintings that they exhibited recently. Um, sorry, I'm going beyond your question. But <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can have some questions from the room. I have a quick question. Did he carry did this Chokanu? Cho yeah. Did he carry all of these 
Seals? Oh, oh no, way? not not at all. Oh yeah, uh, actually, I uh, is the, the building the, his estate uh, existed until the 1980s. I saw his uh, I think great grandson. I visited him twice in the house that Chokinu lived in after he left Mount Pukaji, and they brought out the seals. Not all of them, but they were in big lacquer box with all kinds of. Uh, things and we uh, we looked at maybe a hundred or more. There were amazing seals so that there was a, a, a seal that was maybe this big, but you push the center and it's carved on four sides. You push it out. There's another seal that's also carved on that inside that that you push that out and there's smaller one. So there's one seal that was nested inside each other, all made out of stone. And the total number of impressions, different seals, was about 16 or so. Uh, and and uh, as you disassembled it, so uh, these kinds of things were. It's clever, but actually, it's not just clever. The seal carving was very high quality and interesting the inscriptions and so forth. So uh, it's sort of a all kinds of unusual uh, things that he had in this uh, seal group. Now, just what's happened to them uh, is uh, is unclear at this moment. Uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. And is uh, again, when you're talking about iconographic Zen paintings, there's there's paintings of Daruma, of course, and, and there's paintings of Kanon. But beyond a few figures like that, the biggest number is Rakan. Uh, and so there's a huge uh, tradition of painting Rakan, not, not just in Obaku, but in Zen painting. You go to Daitokuji, there are ancient Sung uh, Rakan paintings, and there's, there's even Tang Rakan paintings that still exist in Japan. Amazing. Uh, uh, and the Rakan tradition has gone through all kinds of different things, but it's been followed in Japan. And uh, interestingly enough, the literati painters who mostly were nominally, if anything, uh, Neo-Confucian in various ways, but also very interested in Buddhism at the same time, which wasn't considered as contradictory. Uh, uh, and their Buddhist interests also involved Rakan paintings. So uh, Rakan paintings became, in the literati tradition, very popular in the 18th century, but exploded in the late uh, um, Edo and Meiji, uh, and continued to be into Taisho, but particularly Meiji and Taisho, the number of Rakan paintings by all kinds of paintings uh, just exploded. And uh, partly they're humorous, they're often, you know, they're wildly eccentric figures as they're painted, but also I think there's a, uh, a human interest. Uh, I mean, uh, ultimately there's not a simple answer to this, uh, but you could say as a popular phenomenon, Rock on paintings, which have always been a big part of the Japanese tradition, became explosively popular. People that were not literati paintings, uh, uh, painters, uh, Suzuki Shonen, who's more associated with uh, uh, Shijo, uh, did enormous numbers of rock on paintings. Uh, but he also did a lot of Zen paintings. He did a giant uh, dragon on the temple at uh, Tenryuji and other things. But uh, I think there was... Um, Compared to a formal iconic image, the eccentricity, the deformity of, of, uh, of Rakan. And of course, today, uh, deformity is usually looked at as a pure negative, but in the Chinese tradition, deformity often meant special powers. You know, if your head is all strange, it means you have special powers, you know, and so it's not a, uh, it's a plus factor, uh, not necessarily in beauty contest, but in a spiritual level, it's, it's a positive sign. And so you're, you're having uh, uh, these kinds of uh, figures uh, doing miraculous things. They're fun, they're funny, but also they're, um, they're human in some ways, that formal iconic figures are elevated and kind of sort of above the human world in some way. Uh, but Rakan, because of their, ex they have magical powers and they're, but, but there's something 
human and humorous and anecdotal. They're full of stories and anecdotes about them. So even people that weren't maybe interested in uh, Buddhism would look at a rock on painting and say, look, look what they're doing over here and over here. And it's all different. It's miraculous. And it's, it's almost like a carnival. Uh, and, and for these uh, reasons, and probably more as well, uh, there is ex enormous number. So you have a famous painter uh, doing lots of them and, and they're very simple and he did very complicated ones with heavy color and use of gold and stuff. Those would be very expensive, but these would have been more approachable financially. And, and, and so you could get a rock on painting by a famous painter, not too expensive, but you know, accessible and have a unique poem and, and even the design. Uh, some people doing lots of non-tembo did uh, endless numbers of the same design, but uh, Chokini was doing all these rock on, they're very simple, but they're all different. Uh, and, and so there's a sense of individuality and unique, uniqueness as well as the multiplicity factor. I don't know if that, that helps. <laughs> yeah. question, because the time when the Japanese monks emerge as the major forces in the monk religion community, mm -hmm. that's the time when uh, Confucianism was on the rise as well. Mm -hmm. Aisho, for example. Mm -hmm. He was a friend of uh, Ogyosola. Right. And so a number of these priests actually studied with Ogyosola. Exactly. <laughs> so represented very important thinking mm -hmm. back to the ancient times. The Chinese texts. Right, and right. The Japanese with a unique understanding. Uh, so, so this is also related to the Bongjin culture. Actually. Absolutely, so, yeah. So, so that's the, the first question. The second question is how strong uh, was the Oba identity among the Japanese monks? Mm -hmm. Yes, probably they get the Dharma transmission, mm -hmm. but later, like uh, 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 Bashao, right? Mm -hmm. So he got the ordained in the Oba mm -hmm. tradition, but he later he just left. Mm -hmm. And also in the later time, we're talking about this, this is probably end of the 19th century. Yeah, yeah, so at that yeah. time, our impression is that Oba was in the general. In the yeah, yeah, society. yeah, yeah. And, and then how strong and they, they may still have this nominal about identity, but mm -hmm. what they're doing is completely you know, so yeah. without any constraint uh, from the, the monk mm -hmm. And some monks like uh, uh, Kawakuchi Eikai, for example, mm -hmm. he went to Tibet, who was mm -hmm. famous in the yeah, yeah, tradition, yeah. about to search for this kind of he yeah. was a, a nominally uh, the monk. But he wasn't really very much into the Obaku tradition and the yeah. liturgical tradition. Yeah. So, so I just two questions. One is about his relationship with uh, the Confucianism, Buddhist yeah, culture yeah, in yeah, general. Yeah, yeah. Second one is the Obaku identity. Of yeah, the yeah, Japanese yeah, 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 yeah. These are both uh, excellent questions and both huge. Uh, uh, one, the relationship with uh, Obaku priests and Japanese Obaku priests in particular with Neo-Confucianism is huge. Uh, but not only Neo-Confucianism, some of them were involved with Kokugaku and other kinds of things going on. It's a time of uh, great eclecticism uh, with uh, intellectuals of many different uh, uh, traditions mixing together uh, and it's not like they're all friends. There can be huge controversies and even antagonisms. But overall, it was a very lively intellectual atmosphere with people doing many kinds of things. And one of the most interesting things about uh, Chokinu and in, in, involved with Neo-Confucianism, Chikud and his father took him to Osaka when he was young to have him trained by Oshio Heihachiro, uh, who was the police uh, he was one of the police magistrates uh, of uh, Osaka, but also a deep neo-confusion Wang Yangming uh, scholar at a time when Wang Yangming teachings were prohibited by the government. <laughs> and uh, he got, he was in the school, he was teaching Wang Yangming, but he, 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 he labeled it like the study of Mencius or something like this to give him cover <laughs> for what he was actually doing. And, and Wang Yangming, uh, uh, it was uh, huge in revolutionary movements during his time in, in the 20th century, you know, both Taiwan and the communists claim Wang Yangming <laughs> as inspiration. Uh, uh, so uh, in any case, he took 
uh, Chokinu as a child who was about 12 and put him in the school of Wang Yang, uh, of uh, Hoshio Chusai or uh, Heihachiro. And, and uh, he was there for a number of years uh, and left just before uh, uh, the abortive uprising where uh, Heihachiro led an attack uh, on, on the wealthy, powerful people of Osaka because of how they were neglecting people during a rice famine. And uh, everybody died. <laughs> a part of the, the city was burned down. It was a complete failure in one way, but it's been a, a controversy and an ongoing uh, uh, thing. And it, it gets back to a central point, I think, of... Uh, commonality in my mind, and I think in the minds of some people, it's controversial, that uh, in Mong Yang Ming School, one of the central tenets, if you claim to believe something, but you don't act on it, not only are you, it's more, people might say hypocrite, but it's deeper than that. It's, if you claim to know something, you don't act on it, you don't really know it yet. Uh, so, uh, so it's very core, you know, it's not a simple like ducking and covering and being a hypocrite. It's like, you don't even know what you're talking about. And, and so it's a very fundamental thing. It's true for Zen. Koans can all be explained intellectually. Many people have done this. If you dig away, they're supposed to be not analyzable, but actually they are analyzable. And many people have done this. Uh, but you can analyze and understand the delicate and complicated uh, philosophical roots of Cohen study backwards and forwards so you can explain it to the nth degree. But that doesn't mean you've experienced it. Uh -uh. And, and to think that you understand it fully intellectually that's an, a serious accomplishment. I'm trying, not trying to downplay that. That's, that's serious scholarship and it has serious meaning. But in this end sense, if you don't, have you haven't had experiential uh, understanding of what this is, it's still uh, part of the story rather than the whole story. So in both the Zen tradition and some types of Neo-Confucianism that we're also doing meditation of a very similar Zen type and have many cross currents, in fact, in my own study of both of these things, uh, uh, at first I was rather critical of Neo-Confucianism from a Zen standpoint and that they're not doing enough or they make compromises or they're too concerned with social order over spiritual uh, realization. But eventually I came to a different perspective that um, being a Zen master or just doing study in a monastery is a very artificial greenhouse situation. In other words, inside the monastery, everything has been calculated to promote your meditation. All the normal uh, distractions have been removed to simplify and be, for making great progress in, in uh, meditation and spiritual insight in an intense, comparatively rapid way. It's a wonderful system. However, you know, it's, um, it's very artificial. Uh, so you take a Zen master, you take away the robes and you put him in a, in a village of the homeless. What are they gonna do, you know? Uh, what is their Zen saying going to, how are they gonna deal with that? Can they deal with that? Or just, you know, uh, put them into a arranged marriage. <laughs> How are they gonna deal with that? You know, uh, part of the problem with uh, the Zen tradition is uh, it's overemphasis on lineage and respecting the past. The uh, Tang period is often held up as the time of the giants, you know, like nobody can, enter, you know, uh, equal the level of the Tang. Uh, I think this is ridiculous. It, uh, if you're talking about the nature of reality, it's not changing by periods. You're talking about people. Uh, there are great people of various kinds at any time. And, and uh, this uh, reflection on the past uh, and the, the Cohen study in particular, uh, which is very effective in some ways, it creates genuine psychological pressure that can put people 
if it's working properly, that's a big if, but if it's working properly, can actually trigger uh, psychological changes and experiences that can be deep and profound. On the other hand, the process itself that has to start, you're dealing with Tong and Sung uh, Cohen situations. The first thing is to identify with the situation. Well, wait a minute. What were they doing in the Tang and Sun period? Were they looking deep, deep to the past? No, they were looking at the moment. And the fact that koans have been for centuries now trying to identify with these things, understand their significance now. Life is full of koans. We all have koan situations in our daily life. Real Zen deals with the immediate. It's not about reconstructing the past. And even worse than the koan structure in its bad part is a capping phrase where you've got your realization has been, you've understood the koan, and now you're supposed to go through uh, volumes of Chinese poetry looking for a poetic expression of this in somebody else's word that perhaps ridiculous. It's a great way to study Chinese poetry and you can memorize all kinds of things. And I'm a huge advocate of classical Chinese poetry is well worth reading and studying. But as a way of demonstrating your understanding, this is scholasticism, it's not Zen. Uh, and, uh, and so for Zen to re revive, uh, it needs to be facing the present, not talking about, oh, in the past they were capable of these things. If we're not capable of them now, they weren't capable of the past, and it's all a fairy story. You know? So it's, it's, uh, it's, and this is where Neon Confucianism come in, because they're grappling with a lot of the same issues, but they're doing it in family social context. They're not in the monastery. Their face, their koans are being thrown at them by civil and uh, con, uh, uh, bureaucratic nonsense and the structures they're in and the family complications and all of these things. And they're trying to take their understanding of the nature of reality and deal with it in a day-to-day -day struggle, which is extremely difficult and it defeats most people. Uh, but, but it's a real occupation. You don't have to identify with it. You're already in it. Uh, and and uh, so uh, none of this is easy, and, uh, but uh, it's part of the, the problem and why religious and Zen itself has gone through cycles of, uh, of getting better and getting worse. And the fact that Obaku was so readily uh, taken on during the 17th century was partly because of the corruption of the Rinzai sect. Uh, uh, both financially and social structure. And people were realizing that these people are wealthy, they can do great calligraphy, they know Chinese poetry, and they look great inside the monastery. <laughs> but, you know, who are they really, you know? And, and so, but this wasn't just a social critique from outside, but it was inside. Uh, uh, the monks were saying, this guy is just repeating what his teacher told him, but does he really know what he's saying? Is this really real? You know, and so you have a new tradition with new new people and new new things, and there's hope, you know, like maybe this will be a different path that will work better. And the fact that people like Dopa Show and Gatan and others were quickly, I mean, it's particularly interesting to me that uh, Dopa Show studied with Takuan and Ishi Bunshu were two of the, the legendary greats of their time, and yet quickly changed to Obaku. Why? We don't really know the answer, but clearly that he rushed to Nagasaki after training with two of the best people uh, raises questions, you know. And, uh, and so there are lots of things to study of interest in all of this. And, um, uh, and it's not just a historical study because uh, in understanding these things, we understand a lot about culture and how people interact. Uh, when we see things today in society, you know, and we think this isn't going right, what's our basis for doing something different? Is it that we uh, are of a different culture or a different religion or a different political party, or is it something deeper? Uh, and if it is something deeper or whatever, what do we do about things? There's no easy answers to these things, but they're, they're real cons. They're real psychological pressure cookers. Uh, and uh, and uh, they can, there's no magic here. You can, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
you can attempt things and fail at it. Uh, there's no guarantees. Uh, uh, on the other hand, it may be something that leads to a deeper understanding or a deeper level of connection uh, with other people and social situations. And so comparing certain types of neoconfucianism and Zen is extremely interesting. And I think they were all aware of this, you know. And so there's heavy, complex interactions between them uh, and even Kokugaku and, and other things that were going on in the Edo period. So it's all, it's tangled and complex, but the interesting thing is that you start reading more and more, you discover things that are just amazing that people were talking about and uh, thinking about and attitudes that they had that are not brought up in your Wikipedias of the world. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, it's uh, really exciting to do this kind of research. That's all.